before we take communion this morning, I want to spend some time talking with you about the Lord's Supper. And I thought of an area in life where we're used to doing something like this. If you guys have been part of a sports team, maybe in high school, then you probably had a team meal before competitions. I don't know if you remember those. Um, uh, for like the BGM football team will have a team breakfast on Friday mornings before they compete and that's that's the tradition that they have um, the the volleyball team I know does the same at BGM uh, when I was an uh, when when I was an athlete uh, that I don't know if I ever qualified in that category uh, but when I was doing sports in high school we would have our, our cross-country team would have a meal before race day and we were trying to carb load there so it was uh, always some, so, some form of pasta. We were trying to consume as many carbs as we possibly could uh, before race day. And the, they really ruined the wrestling meal because when I was a wrestler, we would weigh in at the home site before, on, the, on the morning of competition before school. And so you could weigh in and then go to breakfast. And that was the best meal in the world. When you've been cutting weight and you've been trying to shed all those pounds, you could weigh in at 6 a.m. And then I, sometimes I could wrestle seven or eight pounds heavier than I weighed in that morning. And uh, that, oh, that breakfast, uh, together with the team after weigh-ins, uh, was, was an awesome celebration. Uh, this is something the Nebraska Cornhuskers did, some, a tradition they developed in the 90s. Did you guys know I was going to bring them up when I started talking about this? They had always had a team breakfast before on the day of competition, so on Saturdays. Uh, but I don't know if you guys remember this reputation that Nebraska had in the 90s, but they had some tr players with a tendency to get in trouble a little bit with the law sometimes. And uh, so they figured out what we could do is we come and bring them together for a team meal on Fridays and then have a mandatory team movie. <laughs> so that they can't be out getting in trouble and getting arrested. Instead, we will trap them at this supper and then we'll make them watch a movie with us and then hopefully by then they'll be tired enough to go to bed so that we can play football instead of get bailed out on Saturday. I wonder if that's a little bit uh, what Jesus had in mind the Thursday before uh, he was crucified. I'm gonna have to sequester these disciples a little bit so they don't get in too much trouble but I want to talk about that event that night. And before we do, I want to talk about a theme that came up in our Bible reading a little this week. Uh, we're, doing, uh, we're reading through the Bible together as a church in 2024. And so uh, that, you'll find that plan printed on the back of your bulletin, or you can find copies of the, the year-long reading plan out in the foyers. But this last week, uh, if you're reading along with us, we read Lamentations, Daniel, and Matthew 1 through 4. And I want... Uh, over and over again in this reading, we had the theme of kingdom come up. And uh, we, we read it in Matthew, as we began Matthew this week. Uh, it says uh, in Matthew chapter 3, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. That was this, this incredible news that he was here to present. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And then uh, John gets arrested at the end of John chapter 3. And so, it, or actually in the middle of John chapter 4, John gets arrested, at, or Matthew chapter 4, rather. John gets arrested. And then we read, after John gets arrested, from that time on, Jesus began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And the kingdom of heaven was very much something that the Jews of Jesus' day were thinking about were anticipating and hoping for, and a large part of the reason they were hoping for a kingdom from heaven was because of another passage that we read this week, this time from Daniel. The book of Daniel was, to a first century Jew, roughly equivalent to what Revelation is for us today. Daniel contains really vivid imagery that speaks in some way to the reality of the future, and people in that time were fixated with correlating the events of this apocalyptic literature in Daniel to events of their modern times, to things that were going on in earthly kingdoms, the way that many people do with Revelation today. And their hopes centered on one character in that book, one like a son of man described in Daniel chapter 7. This character in Daniel's, in Daniel's prophecy uh, was supposed to come after the succession of some beastly kingdoms. 
In fact, in Daniel 7, he comes after an especially terrible fourth beast, a kingdom with iron teeth and ten horns, a kingdom that I think now we can safely associate with the Roman Empire. And this one, like a son of man, in Daniel 7, would come on the clouds of heaven, approach the Ancient of Days, and be given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language would worship him. His dominion would be an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. More than that even, this everlasting kingdom that was to be established by this one like a son of man character in Daniel chapter 7 was going, then going to be handed over to God's holy people. And that's the part they were really looking forward to. They wanted to experience, to be a part of this kingdom of God that was all powerful and, and ruled all nations. In Daniel 7, it says, But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. In verse 27, it says, Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. This one like a son of man character here in Daniel 7 was the key to all of this according to God's word. Everyone was looking out for him. Everyone was waiting for him to appear because they wanted to be given his kingdom. I tell everyone who will listen that you need to read Daniel to understand the Gospels. That is because Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man 78 times in the Gospels. This is the title that he uses for himself. This is the role he sees himself fulfilling. I'll show you one here in Matthew 17 that I put on the screen. Uh, it says, when they came together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, to his disciples, the son of man, there's that character from Daniel 7, is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day, he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. His message... Jesus' message had started to catch on at the end of his ministry, and the crowds were beginning to associate Jesus and his teaching and his miraculous power with the hope of this prophecy's fulfillment. They were starting to put the pieces together on who Jesus might be and what he might deliver to them. And that is why on Palm Sunday, as Jesus approached Jerusalem from Bethany over the Mount of Olives, they rush out proclaiming the words of a messianic prophecy in Zechariah and a psalm of deliverance, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It is because they believe they are receiving a deliverer who will usurp the beasts, who will throw out these other earthly kingdoms who are oppressing them. They are receiving someone who will take power and then give it to God's people which they believe is themselves. That's why they brought palm branches. Palm branches were a symbol of Judean national identity. It was printed on their money the same way that eagles are printed on the currency of the United States. So they were waving palm branches at Jesus because they believed that he was going to establish a kingdom that would defeat all the beastly kingdoms of the earth and that they would receive this all-powerful kingdom from God themselves. They wanted Jesus to give them a kingdom. You can imagine their frustration building then over the next week in the gospel stories when Jesus appears to be doing the opposite of what they hoped for. Instead of taking the reins of political power in Jerusalem, he clears the temple of the retailers. He speaks critically of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. To his disciples, he promises doom for the temple, which they had just finished constructing. They rapidly lost faith that Jesus was the one, was the one like a son of man from Daniel 7. The one that they had hoped for, that they welcomed into Jerusalem, all of a sudden was being, it was being made clear to them that he was not it. They believed. But on the Thursday night after Palm Sunday, Jesus was going to do something remarkable. Not for the crowds this time. It's not as busy and as loud as Palm Sunday. On, on the Thursday before Jesus was crucified, 
he shares a meal in an upper room with his disciples. And we're going to focus on the Last Supper this morning. As we do, I need you to remember this kingdom context about the Son of Man. As we talk about the Last Supper, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 22, if you want to open there with me. Uh, That's on page 1056 in your pew Bible. And as we look at the Last Supper, I want you to, to keep in mind this context, the fact that part of the expectation of a Messiah was this expectation of a kingdom that would be given to God's people, of a kingdom that would have power over all nations, that would have all authority that God's people themselves would receive. This moment where Jesus meets with his disciples in the upper room is an incredibly crucial moment in the Gospels, and we can tell that Jesus knows it's special. Uh, In Luke 22, starting in verse 14, we read this. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Jesus knew that this moment was going to be special, that there was something unique about this time that they were going to share. He says, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And I want to remark on on that for a moment. It's so important to know that Jesus gives his life for us and that this occasion here that Jesus shares with his disciples is a Passover. Passover is a celebration of the event that happened in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus on the evening of the 10th plague when a destroying angel went out from the Lord and killed all the firstborn in Egypt except those who, whose houses, those, the houses of the Israelites who had been obedient to God's command to sacrifice a lamb, share a meal with their family, and paint the blood of their sacrificed lamb on the door frames of their houses. The angel of death passed over them And then from that moment, they were set free. From that moment, from that plague, from that deliverance, they were allowed to leave slavery in Egypt and become their own people, their own kingdom. When Jesus in this passage says, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God, what he means is that the Passover meal, uh, the next one after this one, that Jesus celebrates together with the disciples will be the wedding banquet of the Lamb spoken of in Revelation 19, the one that will follow Judgment Day. But Jesus understands that this time is going to be special. Something incredible is going to happen in this moment between Jesus and his disciples. John gives us an insight into what Jesus was thinking in anticipation of this meal. In John chapter 13, uh, we, it just tells us a little bit more about Jesus' mindset as he approaches this moment. Uh, There, starting in verse 1, it says, It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Okay, so that tells you a little bit about Jesus' mindset going into this meal. He knew he was about to suffer. He knew it was the end. And Jesus knew that God had put all things under his power. That's imagery from Daniel 7. That is what God was going to do for the one like a son of man who was going to be given all authority and power. So as Jesus knows this, as he has this mindset coming into this meal, the very next words we read in John are, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. It's remarkable, isn't it? That the one like a son of man from Daniel 7 has appeared and is this glorious introduction in Daniel 7, and we see that Jesus has been given all power by God. And what does he do with it? He wraps a towel around his waist and begins to wash his disciples' feet. Now, John's gospel is the only one that records the foot washing event for us. But it's present in Luke, too, where you have it opened. Jesus washed the disciples' feet in John to teach them humility and that the greatest among them is the one who serves. And you can see that going on in Luke 
uh, without the foot washing, when you read verses 24 through 27 of Luke 22, if you look in verse 24, 24, you'll see there it says, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors, but you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? It is not the one who is at the table. But Jesus says, but I am among you as one who serves. Jesus is making a point here in the gospel that he's made all through the gospel of Luke that in God's kingdom, the greatest is the one who serves. This is going to be a hallmark of Jesus' followers because it's a characteristic of Jesus himself. And in Luke's account, this should have been incredibly obvious because of what preceded it. Go up from these words we just read up to verse 17 in Luke 22, in this account of the Lord's Supper. This is the very beginning of the account of the meal for Luke, starting in verse 17. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. You see, he had just given them instructions about how to take bread and wine in remembrance of him. He had just said that his blood was poured out for them. He had just told them that he was going to be the ultimate act of humility, the ultimate example of sacrifice. And here they are arguing about who is going to be the greatest. With these elements, with the bread and the wine, Jesus is trying to help them understand what this was all about. Knowing what would happen the next day, he was attempting to help them process what they would witness when his body was broken and his blood was spilled. Even in retrospect, he was trying to help them understand what this whole ministry had been about. Their whole time he spent together with them. So he gave them a meal. Not just something they could hear with their ears, but something they could take with their hands and eat. To know the price of the kingdom. That's what he was helping them understand. To know the cost of redemption for God's people was the costly, painful, dreadful service of God's son, the Messiah, Jesus. He was showing them in that moment that there would be a new Passover. Now there was a greater sacrifice. There was an offering of blood that was once for all. But you have to understand something clearly. Passover was not just a celebration of being spared from the angel of death. Passover was about more than that. Passover was about what resulted from that moment. What resulted from from the Israelites being spared from the angel of death on that night of Passover? They were set free. And they could begin an Israelite kingdom. Before Passover in Exodus, they were just an ethnic group in Egypt. After Passover in Exodus, they were a nation, a kingdom belonging to God. Now in the upper room, Jesus is instituting a new Passover. This one in the blood of God's own son instead of some Passover lamb. Thus, there will be a new kingdom, a liberation for God's people. Now, let's pick up up where we stopped earlier, uh, down in verse 28 of Luke 22. Verse 28, we read this. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus confers on them the kingdom in this moment. 
The Last Supper is the conference of a kingdom. The Last Supper is this moment that was talked about in Daniel chapter 7 where all authority which had been given to God's Son, or it's kind of this, this mesh, this, this is happening as Jesus is crucified and resurrected, is being given to God's holy people at this moment. As Daniel prophesied so long ago, the Ancient of Days was about to be given all authority on heaven, was about to give to the Son of Man all authority on heaven and earth. He was about to approach the Ancient of Days. Do you remember what the result of that was to be? The kingdom was to be given to the holy people of the Most High. So Jesus here in this room tells his followers at the institution of communion, as they share the bread and share the wine, he says, I'm giving the kingdom to you. When you eat the bread and when you drink the cup, you're not just remembering the death of Christ. That is a crucial part of what we do at communion. But you are also declaring the kingdom which you have received from him through his redemptive work. When we share communion from these trays... You're acknowledging the king who has conferred on you a new way to live in the world. Who's given you a, a new nation to belong to in his name. When you take it, you're declaring allegiance to the kingdom of God's son, Jesus. Because as Daniel had said centuries earlier, when the son of man is given power by the ancient of days, he will give the kingdom to God's holy people. It is the kingdom of Jesus' body and blood, and it is ours through the incredible grace of God. And each Sunday at the Lord's table, we have the opportunity to receive it. When the tray is passed to you, you have the opportunity to swear allegiance to your king. When you partake of the cup and the bread, you have the opportunity to forswear any other kings or kingdoms. To make your life about the kingdom of the Son of Man. To be reminded about how, not just what Jesus has done, but, but who you are in his kingdom. It is a chance for us to experience clarity in that moment, in our hearts and in our minds, about who we belong to and what purpose our lives serve. The word Messiah in the Bible is a transliteration of a Hebrew word that me literally means anointed one. To say that Jesus is the Messiah is to say literally that Jesus is the anointed king over God's holy people. It is to recognize that he serves in the role of the one like a son of man in Daniel 7 to whom is given all authority and power. And this morning, as we pass the trays, understand that by his body and by his blood, you and I have received a kingdom from heaven. And all of who we are belongs to that Messiah. That is something that we declare when we partake of his body and partake of his blood at communion. Pray with me. Dear Holy Father, thank you for the incredible gift of our Lord's kingdom. Thank you for the opportunity to belong to something so powerful, to be called according to his name. Dear God, when we partake of these elements, when we eat the bread and drink the juice, God, we are reminded of the incredible cost of that the kingdom cost. We're reminded of the incredible debt that we owed before you because of our guilt and the incredible way that you worked to redeem us so that we can be called according to your name, so that we could be given the kingdom of the Most High. Dear Heavenly Father, bless our hearts and our minds as we're reminded of this in this moment as we partake of the elements of communion, as we are obedient to your word in the way that we remember your son Jesus. I pray these things in your name. Amen.